Professor Shaw is the Mary Dell Chilton Distinguished Professor of Biology at Washington University in St. Louis. She is also the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Washington University in St. Louis. She is nationally and internationally recognized for her scholarship over the last many years. And she was one of the first people who was looking at evolution and populations and domestication history to really get in on that wave of using DNA and the molecular world to infer uh, some of the insights that we might now think are quite remarkable and were unimaginable just uh, 20 or 25 years ago. She has over 200 publications. She's trained 36 PhD students, and she has advanced uh, her our knowledge in everything from systematics to the biology of invasive species. Uh, she's worked on the way that genes move between populations in nature, uh, and she's done some amazing things. Uh, although we won't hear about rice tonight, she's been very important in understanding or in, in uncovering how the domestication history of rice, one of the most important food crops uh, on which humans have essentially uh, grown up over the last 10,000 years. Uh, she's done some extraordinary work there. But she's worked on pitcher plants. If you like blackberries and raspberries, I guarantee you she's had her hand in some of those things. Uh, Right? <laughs> yeah. It makes me hungry just thinking about all of this stuff. And she's also done some things that are outside of the laboratory and outside of leadership within the university uh, context. She's been the president of the Botanical Society of America. She's been the president of the Society for the Study of Evolution. And she's been president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. She's an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, where she's served as vice president for eight years. Former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton appointed her as a U.S. science envoy, and from 2009 to 2017, she was a member of President Obama's Council of Advisors for Science and Technology. I don't think there are any advisors for science and technology right now, <laughs> so she might be out of a job on that front. I say no more. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Barbara here uh, to this lecture series and to Harvard. Uh, she has been an inspiration for so many of us uh, through just a total devotion to plants from her growing up days. And I'll just add, uh, at the National Academy of Sciences website, if you'd like to hear something quite wonderful, there's a wonderful interview that they did with you that's posted there that goes back to your childhood and uh, reflects on what it means to come to a career in science and botany and a love of plants uh, that I would encourage all of you to stream. Anyway, Barbara, welcome. Well, um, thank you. That was really very, very nice. It doesn't sound like anybody I know. Um, <laughs> I, I'm really absolutely so delighted to be here. Um, particularly uh, on, on a series that deals with evolution, because evolution is such an amazing process, and it's so just wonderful and, and interesting. And so I'm really grateful to the Dr. Suet for, for providing support to have a series on evolution. And I know I've talked to some other folks that have um, given lectures in the series, and they've talked about how enjoyable it was and how much fun it was interacting with the audience. So thank you all for being here. So what I'm going to talk about is something that is really interesting, um, and that is the relationship between biological species and humans. This has been going on for a very long time, obviously, um, and domestication of plants and animals started maybe 15,000 to 13,000 years ago, and it's actually continuing now. And so we're going to look at the course of that and some of the differences between plants and animals. Um, but let's begin with just looking at human populations. So plants and humans have a co-evolutionary, um, plants and animals have a co-evolutionary um, interaction with each other. Um, and they, um, when we talk about co-evolution, it means that one species, as it changes, influences the other species. It responds in response to that change, and it goes back and forth. And this is really what has happened between, um, between humans and a lot of biological species. Of course, the very first thing 
is food, the relationship of food to, to humans. And this is um, one of our ancestors, Australopithecus. And one of the interesting things is that, of course, this, um, this hominid was, um, was adapted to the food that it ate. And the thought is that looking at the dentition, at the skull, it probably was a forced um, uh, organism that ate, ate large nuts. You can see little nuts in the corner there, um, tubers and things like that. And so it required a powerful jaw, um, thick enamel, animal, enamel, there we go, on the teeth. Um, and as humans evolved, if we look at a human skull, this one didn't have a copyright, so that's why it's got a screw in its head. You can, you can buy this at universalmedical.com. And you can see the, the, the skull here. The teeth are smaller. The, you don't have a brow ridge. And it's thought that, that as humans began to eat animal food and to cook, that it was more digestible. So the skull was modified. The gut, it's estimated, was very long when you have very coarse food. And, and our, our gut, the, est the estimations are that it became shorter. So there was an adaptation to food. This is over the course of, of, of evolution. We can look a little more recently about such things as when we had domestication. So this is a picture of um, plowing in Taiwan. It's going to be a rice field, so no plants, but it's close. And as humans began to domesticate cattle and camels and goats and horses, they first had them, incorporated them um, into their environments and then began to, to um, drink milk. I think as many of you know, particularly if you're lactose intolerant, that we have lactase um, and we can, we can consume milk when we're, we're very young, mammals when they're very young. And as one ages, you no longer have, um, in the course of evolution, milk in the diet, and so we lose the ability and, and become lactose intolerant. If you look at, the distribu at where um, there was an original domestication of cattle, Neolithic farmers, um, which are in these dark areas here, and then lay on top of that in, in Europe where there is um, high frequencies of lactose tolerance throughout the life cycle, there's a correspondence. Um, even if you begin to look at diversity of, of milk alleles, there's a correspondence. And so, so even in the, the evolutionary differences and the polymorphisms within this group here, it's the result of the kind of food that we ate. Um, and again, this happens all over for different kinds of milk. So independently, um, Arisen has been lactose tolerance in, for camel milk and for goat milk um, and different genes, um, different, different origins of this. So many people feel that it, while we have the internet and Facebook and we have airplanes and all of the amazing things that happen now, um, strontium lattice clocks and GPS, that domestication of plants and animals is probably the most uh, significant development over the last 10,000 years. Because what it allowed was for a much more consistent and more abundant food source. And so that what allowed the opportunity to, um, to develop permanent villages. It allowed the human population to grow. I'm not sure if you'd want to call it an explosion. Um, and it allowed a division of labor, and it allowed um, individuals to develop various kinds of technologies, such as brewing beer, um, and which is an important one, and also um, to develop culture. And, we, and so, so this is one of the very earliest cities um, where, again, there's archaeological evidence of, of plants being domesticated or in plants being used. Um, so we've seen how the association with plants and animals has changed humans. So humans have responded to their diets. What we're going to talk about now is how plants and animals have responded to their association with humans. And so the general feeling is that animals, uh, a major change, and, and there's many of them, but one of them is that animals became more docile and less fearful. It is natural for wild animals to um, become aggressive when confronted. That's, we see that very often. If you've ever seen a skunk that gets angry, it's pretty aggressive. Um, and also, it's, it's very um, common for them to be very fearful, particularly hooved animals. When they become frightened, um, they're, they're very, very um, skittish, if you will. Um, when, you, when they became domesticated, they were much less aggressive, much less fearful. Plants, when they were domesticated, became easier to grow. 
um, lots of changes in terms of the ease of germinating seeds. They became also um, more robust and they had a greater yield. And so these are some major changes and we're gonna explore those changes in plants and animals. And of course, some of the, the, um, the Egyptian um, artwork really shows the relationships between, um, between animals and, and plants and, and humans. So domestication is an evolutionary process. When we say that a species is, species is d domesticated, it means that it has undergone genetic changes from its wild ancestors. And I'm sure if you've been to other um, lectures in this series, you know that there's sort of this, um, the, the, this, this name almost about domestication. And, that, and this is what Charles Darwin showed, was that species are genetically variable. So that if you go out into nature and you look at a species, there's, gen, there's, there's variable traits. Um, could be traits for um, robustness. Um, it could be variation in flower color. It could be all sorts of different things. Um, and this genetic, then this variability has a genetic basis. And so that's, that's sort of the substrate for evolution, genetically variable traits. And then for domestication, some of these traits are going to be more favorable in human environments. They're going to, with animals, cause the animal to be less fearful. Um, for plants, they might, um, the ones that have better seeds or are better tasting. So there's going to be, um, um, among the wild variation, the natural variation in the species, some of the variants will be more um, uh, appropriate and more for, for humans. And then what humans will do, they will select individuals with these favorable characteristics. And this can be done, um, uh, this can be done consciously or it could be done um, without even thinking about it, um, without d particularly selecting for something, but just simply um, uh, by, by association. And so those individuals that are most adapted or are most um, related to humans or that are most comfortable around humans are the ones that will then be um, used for, uh, for producing the next generation, uh, the ones that will, will be bred or the, the seeds that will be gathered and then, um, and then planted. And so that, that is the evolutionary aspect of this. And um, this has been an amazing process um, for the history of humans. It's amazing for archaeology to look at. But one of the interesting things as an evolutionary biologist is that um, this has been very, very strong selection, very strong selection on the genome of organisms. So when we start to look at the consequences of, of selection in a theoretical way and in an experimental way, we very often use um, natural pl uh, plant species, that's what I work with, to, to look at selection because it is so strong and so powerful. And we know um, a lot about the basis of selection, which um, I'll show you in a little bit. So this is um, not only an amazing process that has important um, consequences for, for humans and for the course of our culture and civilization, but it also provides some very important model systems for studying evolution. Just one little aspect of, of um, of the evolution in, in domesticated species, and that is the concept of a genetic bottleneck. And so if you go out and there's a wild species, we talked about columbines um, before, uh, this, not the columbines, the plants, and they're, they're variable. If you wanted to select one type of them, what would happen is that you would choose just a few individuals. So if this were a wild population of wild horses, um, of wolves, of columbines, of the ancestor of rice, what would happen is humans would basically pick only a few individuals for the next generation. Those would be the individuals that had that were the, the most um, docile. Those would be the individual rice grains that were the most um, the largest or the most fragrant, and that would found the next generation. So th what this does is it re reduces the genetic vari variation, and it also um, very often changes the morphology just simply by sampling. So this constriction of population size is something that people use to study um, all the time. So what happens during the course of domestication? Well, because of the genetic bottleneck, there's a reduction in genetic variation. There are morphological changes. Um, you'll see some of them are directly selected by humans and other happen, others happen as a consequence, an unintended consequence of selection. Um, for animals, there's behavioral changes. Um, there's also changes in the, in the um, timing of reproduction. 
And then something that we're not going to talk about, but that is very, very interesting, and that is very often in the course of domestication, it's not an abrupt isolation between the wild ancestor. Wolves gave rise to dogs. It's not an abrupt um, isolation, but rather there's crossing back and forth. And particularly in populations of, that are very closely associated with humans, such as rice, or cattle, humans when they migrate, and of course the, the human, human history is migrating from one place to another, lots of migrating populations. They took with them their domesticated animals and their domesticated plants, seeds of rice and, and all sorts of things. And then there would be hybridization and crossing with not only the, any wild ancestors, but also with perhaps sometimes other species. We see that in the domestication of cattle. So some very, very complicated evolutionary histories and very, very difficult to unravel. And some of the more recent work is really looking at these processes and trying to figure out how actually did domestication occur. So, one of the interesting things that Charles Darwin noted um, in, 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 in his, throughout his, his work on evolution is that domest there was this domestication syndrome in animals, a suite of characteristics that come together. And what he noticed was that domesticated animals tended to be docile. We understand how that happened. Those would be the individuals that you, that you would want around you. But they also developed floppy ears, and nobody's selected for floppy ears. Um, in border collies, is exactly the opposite. You want um, pointed ears. Also, all of a sudden, um, he noticed that the wild ancestors might, be ancestors might be uniform in color, but the domesticates had all kinds of variation in coat color. And did humans select for that? He didn't think so. It seemed to be, it was sort of a mystery to him, a conundrum. Um, reproduction, timing of reproduction changed. Skull shape has changed, and there's also a lot of size variation. So this has been a puzzle. How did all of this happen? And the thing that's remarkable is that we see it, get ready for a lot of cute animal pictures. <laughs> this is completely, you know, just gratuitous animal pictures. But <laughs> what it does show is what Charles Darwin noticed, is here you got all these floppy ears. Here's a, a pointed ear one, but a little piglet with floppy ears, and that's sheep, and that's a floppy-eared animal, um, a rabbit. And the other thing that you notice is that there's variation um, in, in color. And I think the rabbit and, and the little piglets are a good example of that. They, um, it's very common to see domesticated animals be spotty. So how does this all occur? The, the Darwin thought and folks have thought that this was the result of sort of the consequences of selection, but unintended consequences of selection. So we'll get back to that in just a moment. Um, there's been a lot of work done, this is from Zader in 2012, about um, domestication, uh, particularly of animals. And so it's thought now that there were actually three different ways that domestication occurred. One was a group of organisms that were commensal. There was a commensal pathway. And that meant simply that there was wild animals that tended to associate with human habitations. Um, things like dogs and cats, because humans, of course, have waste. Um, they have uh, garbage piles, waste piles. Um, seeds will germinate there. Um, you can, a human habitation attracts small mammals and um, predators are attracted to that. And so there was this, this suite of organisms around uh, human habitations. Um, one of the early hypotheses was that humans domesticated animals because people kept the young little um, in baby animals as pets. And that now, I think, is, is less prominent. And there's much more, um, more, more thought that it was this commensal pathway. Then there was another pathway where the organisms, um, so, so dogs and cats would be an example of this. Another, where the organisms were first prey. Um, and that would be things such as horses and, and goats and, and, and sheep that first humans hunted them. And then in the course of, of, of interacting with these species, they slowly began to manage the herds. Um, they chose, who, they would, for example, only kill males and let females live because they would reproduce. And so there was this prey pathway, and we'll talk more about that. And then finally, just the directed pathway. Um, 
in many cases with many organisms that are long-term domesticates, after a while, it's not inadvertent selection for something. It's very, very directed. So modern plant breeding, the um, breeding of dogs and horses, all of this is now very conscious selection, artificial selection. And this is interesting because we are domesticating, even as we speak, some, some uh, new species. So the commensal pathway um, it is non-intentional because human, the human uh, niche, our, our, civiliz our uh, campsites and attracted animals. This is a very early picture of a dog work with a hunter. And what happens is that, again, the most docile and least afraid gets food because it's close to the human habitation. And so you have, just by the, the animals that are non-fearful, being able to go and grab some food that has been cast off or grab a bone that's been cast aside, um, this is this kind of inadvertent selection. Um, and the, the course of this is habituation. First, the animal gets used to being around humans. Then it, in fact, becomes uh, not dependent, but uses uh, a commensal relationship. And then you develop a partnership, a hunting partnership. And then there's, there's actually domestication, um, the genetic changes association with domestication. And then later on in the course of, uh, of much more recent times than uh, actual um, genetic domestication where you, you select for particular characteristics. So let's look at the domestication of dogs. Um, it's thought that dog domestication was the earliest um, domestication. And dogs come from um, wolves, from Canis lupus. And there are two species, uh, not two species, two subspecies, the a European gray wolf, um, which gave rise to one lineage of domesticated dogs, and then the Asian wolf, which gave rise to another um, lineage of domesticated dogs. And, the, and domesticated dogs have a fairly complicated history. And one of the remarkable things about um, looking at domestication studies is the advent of using genomics um, to understand um, the relationship among wild ancestors and the domesticated species, and looking at the course of domestication. One of the thrilling things that's happened in the last 15 years is the ability to take bones from archaeological sites to get DNA and, and to analyze that DNA and then compare it to, um, to individuals um, from different sites and also extant species and wild species. And so we've really made a tremendous progress by this um, sort of um, genomic archaeology. It's, it's very, very exciting. And I think um, there's some really wonderful work that's done here at, at Harvard looking at human um, evolution, which is just, I think the, the results are mind boggling. Um, and species that we didn't know about uh, that our ancestors, it's very exciting. And likewise with animal uh, domestication. So there's been a number of studies that have tried to understand the domestication of dogs from these two subspecies of, of Canis lupus. And so this is what's thought has happened. You have in the ancestral wolves um, way back in time, you have Asian wolves, um, ancient Asian dogs to modern Asian dogs. And then again, humans move around and good things get passed around. Um, these Asian dogs were transported over. Uh, at the same time, European wolves were being domesticated, Paleolithic Euro uh, European dogs. We have DNA from some of the Neolithic dogs. And here's the New Grange dog, which um, uh, we have DNA from 4,800 years ago, modern dogs, and again, this movement back and forth. And of course, now with modern animal breeding and with, with people really fancying various breeds of dogs, there's just a huge amount of, of crossing back and forth. So this is the, the history of dogs. And we know this because of um, studies of ancient DNA. So the yellow um, parts are the modern European breeds. Um, the red are the Asian breeds. Down here, you've, you've probably all seen these, these relationships. These, these, um, these, they're phylogenetic trees, but it basically shows, um, it groups things based by their, their genomics, by their DNA. And so what we see, the Asian dogs, like Liang Private, um, these are a lot of village dogs from Asia. They um, come out all here. Then we start to have some intermediate. And then here are the uh, European, uh, modern European breeds. And then right next, to it is this New Grange, um, Ireland, which is a, a dog from 4,800. So we know that that dog at that point was, uh, was, was very closely uh, related to the ancestors of the modern European breeds. 
The other thing that's very interesting, um, here are wolves down here. Um, so they're, they're still quite different. Um, this, this thing down here, that you can't see, is actually a wolf-dog hybrid. And so all of this sorts out to the ancestry and to, um, to, to, to the domesticated dogs and to even some hybrids. So very, very good information on, on the relationship of ancestral dogs. And, and a lot of this is really um, edified because of the ability to use um, ancient DNA. And this is just simply the distribution of those variants. And so you can see that, that there's um, this cluster of Asian dogs. There's also lots of, of potential hybridization and then um, lots, lots of dogs that have um, either a European ancestry or mixed ancestry. So you can begin to see how these genomes, these two genomes from the Asian wolf and, and the, um, uh, the European wolf sort out. So the changes, um, one of the things that we can do is begin to ask about molecular changes. And um, there is an insulin-like growth factor, which people think is a gene, is, is related to some of the size differences. I think one of the amazing things is you have these giant Great Danes. This looks like maybe a pug, and we've got things that are a lot smaller than that. And so in the course of domestication, there was this huge variation for size that people have, have um, have, have selected, and a lot of, of these related to function. So um, dachshunds and a number of the terriers, they were forgetting vermin, um, and so they have a size and, and a short shape and a morphology that allows for that. These are the skull variations, so lots of differences in the skull. This is um, a gray wolf here, very elongated um, uh, nose, which is the, the natural state. Um, this is uh, looking at the side, and you can see the, the large teeth. And then um, ventral, so, so looking, looking up. And this is a Great Dane. This is a Rottweiler. This is a Greyhound. And um, Yorkshire Terrier here. And this is our pug down here. So this is, this is the ancestral state. And these are the kinds of modifications that humans have been able to do. And a lot of this was directed breeding. Um, the initial domestication, the initial, the initial changes was probably due just inadvertently, but now we have very strong selection on all of these different characteristics. Let's get back to Darwin's question. And that, this is something that is relatively recently, and it's, and it's a very interesting in, um, hypothesis. So in 1959 in Russia, uh, Dmitry Belryev and um, Ludmilla Trut, I hope I've said those names correctly, um, but I wanted to shout out their names incorrectly or not, they were beginning to look at the silver, wool, uh, silver foxes. These were used for fur in the fur industry. And in 1959, they began a, a domestication study. What they did was they just simply um, selected for the next generation the, the wild foxes that were the ones that are, were most receptive to humans, the ones that might come closest to a human, the one that might take a little bit of food. Um, and they did that generation after generation. And what they found in 10 years, this is the first pup that appeared with floppy ears. So the selection was for, for tameness and for lack of aggression. And one of the things they began to get was floppy ears after 10 years, only in 10 years. Um, this is a picture of Ludmilla with, with the foxes. And you can see they're obviously very, they, they like her very much. They're, they're very social. And this is pixelated, but these are some of the results. So after a period of time, you ended up getting a fox that looks like one of my border collies. Um, it has the, uh, the, the, um, the spotted black and white. It has, um, it, it has a shorter snout. It, and one of the other characteristics is that they begin to develop curly tails. Um, so he was, they were able to duplicate this the domestication, um, what, the way we thought the domestication occurred, and you ended up getting these unanticipated um, changes, floppy ears and black and white and curly tails. So that's been a, a real question. How does this occur? How can you select for, dom for um, domestication and for behavioral characteristics and end up with a suite of morphological characteristics that we see once in one species after another? So there is a neural crest hypothesis. And the neural crest is something that happens in um, early in, in embryonic development. And it's something that affects the um, development of many different parts of, um, of an animal. 
And so one of the things that we see, um, it affects, and the thought is that in that the neural crest in some cases is less um, less active. There's fewer cells, or there's less cells moving around. Um, and so what it, it does affect it, it. What the selection is is to really affect the brain and to reduce the parts of the brain that cause the fight or flight response. So so it's thought that that was. Um, one of the things that has changed. And as part of that, if there's less active neural crest, that you're going to have um, fewer m melanocytes, with less pig so you'll have pigment changes. Um, you'll have, uh, it affects cartridge, uh, cartilage, and so the cartilage of the tail might be different, um, likewise of the ear. This is a hypothesis. Um, a lot of folks thought it really explained everything. I think we um, people have pulled back on this, um, and now it's thought that it probably works in dogs, but there's still lots of work to be done. But a very interesting idea to try to explain this this sort of inexplicable um, suite of characteristics. One of the things that happens in domestication, and I always found this as as a dog and cat lover um, a little bit offensive, but um, is that and, and a horse lover too. Um, is that it? That when we look at our domesticated organisms, um, such as a pig and mink and cat and dog and ferret, um, sheep, turkey, a turkey we expect not to have a lot of brains, but if you look at them, they have compared to their wild ancestor a reduction in brain size, and this is quite. This is what we see in all of these animal domesticated species. Um, pig, 33% um, decline in brain, um, mink, 20%, ferret, uh, 30%, turkey, 30%. Um, we've got horse for 14, mouse and rat um, less. That's probably because there's a lot of, a lot of hybridization going on. So, so this has been um, a, a really interesting consequence of domestication. And it's thought it has to do with specific parts of the brain that affect the uh, behavioral characteristics. Um, that's, that's the hypothesis. So size of dogs' brains relative to wolves has decreased by nearly 30%. Um, it may have reduced areas of the wolf brain that enabled tolerance to human contact, and it's acute in the limbic system, which is integral to fight or flight responses. And so these are some of the, um, the, the, the work, that, some of the work and some of the papers that have done that. I want to talk about one last thing. Um, there is a, a series, um, it, it was in the public press. How many of you heard about the study that was pr um, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences on puppy dog eyes? Anybody hear about that one? So this is amazing. So these are puppy dog eyes. I told you, and, and just, I know, they're so cute. This is a wolf, a wolf eyes. And what you can see, they tend to be kind of slits, and you don't have um, eyebrows and everything. Um, and so it tends to be much more of a wolf-like, well, it's a wolf-like stare, an intense stare. If you look at domesticated dogs, they have little eyebrows and their eyes get bigger. They're able to, and those of you that have dogs, you know if you're eating dinner and your dog comes up to you, I mean, it's, you know, like, oh, I'm so hungry, I haven't eaten in what, months. And um, it's very effective. And so the thought is that, in fact, humans selected inadvertently for changes in the musculature and in, in the structure around the eyes. Because if you look at an animal and they look sort of like a, like sad and they need food or something, you're more likely to give a food to the animals and that was inadvertent selection. So they examined in this, um, Kaminsky et al. in this paper, in fact, looked at, at, at this. And so this is the, um, the wolf and some of the musculature around the eyes. And then it's much more enhanced in, um, in, in the domesticated dog so that you can actually um, open the eye up a little bit. And so it's a very interesting case of potential um, inadvertent selection. But I think all of us know it's extremely effective. Um, very hard to deny that. So let's look at the prey pathway. So that's the commensal pathway. And dogs are really um, well studied. So this begins with humans hunting, um, hunting for food. Uh, goats, pigs, cows, and horses. And so what, they, what, what it's thought happened was that they began to increase the, uh, as there was more 
hunting pressure on the animal populations. They began to worry about that, and so um, they, there was increased pressure, um, hunting pressure on the prey populations. So there began early management, um, taking only the males, or taking males preferentially to females, because the females would contribute to, uh, to reproduction. And then, then you began to have actually herding and, and having uh, herds that were constrained in particular areas. Um, it's thought that herding may have um, occurred even before the development of, of plant agriculture. And again, we begin to see this associated with some human settlements. And then very quickly, they developed after the herding became and the animals became docile, then they developed other uses, such as transportation, the use of milk, et cetera. So um, we can, uh, one of the uh, examples of this is horse, is the horse. So horse hunting was about 550 um, BP. And it was domesticated for actually hunting for, as a food source. But then the horses were used for actually hunting and m for milking. And so some of the early settlements where there's archaeological sites um, tended to be uh, like this. And you can begin, the reconstructions show uh, the beginning of horse corrals. Um, this is a, one of the famous um, cave paintings of the horses that were being hunted at that time. The timing is such that these were being hunted. And then this is a picture of uh, uh, Preslowski's uh, horse. It was thought that this was the, uh, these few individuals, this, this remnant population, were, were wild ancestors of horse. The most recent thought is that these were very early domesticated and then they escaped. And so this may not be the ancestor. But if you go back, um, there is just a remarkable um, similarity in appearance. And so that's another pathway for animals. And then finally, there's a directed pathway. And this is something that happens much more recently. Again, we've talked about this. This is just koi. Um, and they are selected for, for their appearance, obviously. Um, and then we have a number of new domesticates. And so uh, ferrets, ferrets as pets, um, is a new domesticate, something relatively recent. Ostriches. Um, and then here are our carp for food. And so in the process of domestication, there's a number of small animals that have been recently domesticated. Um, and then there's also a number of, of fish, aquatic species that are being domesticated as, as new food sources. And so a lot of the salmon that we eat is, is domesticated salmon. Now we want to talk about domestication of plants. And so the domestication of plants is, um, this is an urban environment. Um, it looks pretty bad picture, but compared to a field, it's, it, it's quite different. So what domestication of plants allowed was for, um, for a much more reliable food source, a food source that could be harvested and it could be stored and used over a period of time. And again, this is what, what people have thought led to the development of permanent settlements, the development of uh, divisions of labor, increase in population size, and, 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 um, and culture. So this is a very um, important aspect of, of what we do. And when, when, when you think about our, the way that our, our, our civilization, the way that our, our countries are being developed, that more and more people are leaving rural areas and growing their own food, but they're going into cities. And so this kind of agriculture that feeds these cities is something that is necessary for this kind of urbanization. Um, we could have a very long conversation about the consequences of this kind of agriculture. Um, but I think there, there's a strong uh, support that it would be very hard if we didn't have um, large fields like this, if we, uh, we would not be able to feed uh, these large urban populations, which are millions. So what is the path to plant domestication? So the path, uh, this path, um, first is humans began to forage for plants. They went out and they <coughs> gathered food, wild rice seeds um, in, in aquatic environments. They did that with, with um, canoes and with, with other kinds of, of, of uh, floating things, rafts and things. Then the plants became commensal. This is a picture of a, uh, of a squash plant that is growing on a manure pile. Um, it's the best I could do about what some commensal might be. So as, as people harvested food, as they took food to, 
to their, their, their dwellings, their, their tents or their villages. And then they began to throw out waste. Um, or if they gathered um, seeds for the harvest, plants to harvest, they would cut the plants. And the seeds would be um, um, tied onto the plants, but some of them would fall off. So you began to have a lot of the, the species that people were foraging for were living around the environments that people actually habitated. And so they became much more conspicuous. Then the thought the next phase is as, and this is what we, many of us do in our gardens, when I see a volunteer tomato, I don't rip it out as a weed, I usually just say, oh good, free tomato plant, and you just let it grow. That was probably another stage. And then finally there was the, um, the domestication, the conscious collecting of seeds from the best individuals, storing them for the next year, and repeating that process year after year. So domestication in plants was very directed after some of these initial stages. So plants also have a domestication syndrome. Um, what happens in plant domestication, the first thing probably is loss of seed dispersal. Um, that means that the seeds, instead of flying to the winds, would be retained on the plant, and I'll talk more about that. Another thing, of course, that very quickly, you increase the harvest. That's the whole reason for growing plants, is to have a harvest. So harvest, the yield per plant would, it has increased. Um, also, the plants are easier to grow. Um, one of the things that we see is wild plants can often be very large and gangly with low yields. Our um, domesticated plants are much shorter, they're more robust, and they have larger yields. And then also tastier and safer plants. Um, this isn't always talked about, but a lot of the ancestors to some of the plants that we eat, such as fava beans, um, have compounds that can be quite um, um, unpleasant. Uh, in some cases, they can even be toxic. And so making plants tastier, reducing um, these secondary plant compounds so that the food is easier to digest and more um, tasty, more, more palatable, is, is another course of selection that has happened in plants. Some of this very, very early, and a lot of it much later. So some of the first crops, um, we've all heard about the Fertile Crescent, and of course that was where, um, where he had domestication of wheat um, and barley. Uh, peas were an early domesticate. Um, this is the, uh, an African um, bottle gourd. This was domesticated very early as a container, so not, not a use for food as much as a container. And then um, in the Americas, we had corn and also um, squash, uh, cucurbita pipo. Uh, lots of different kinds of cucurbita people. people. So see, these are some of the first crops. Uh, plant domestication is interesting and a little bit different than animal domestication. In many, we have these areas of um, sites of plant domestication. So um, in the United States, the eastern woodland Indians in this area here domesticated a whole suite of different kinds of plants. Um, we don't, a sunflower was, was um, one of them, but many of those plants we don't eat now. We do, we do use sunflower. But uh, domestication of corn, there's a whole suite of, of plants that were uh, domesticated, again, independently in South America. Um, things such as jack beans and, and peppers and uh, cassava. Uh, domestication locations, the different colors are for different times. In Africa, the Fertile Crescent, and of course in, in, in Asia, we have the uh, uh, rice and a number of, of different crops, uh, soybean, and India, uh, lentils, and, um, and then also some, uh, some things in, in Papua New Guinea. So uh, plant domestication is interesting because it happens so many different times in so many different places. And this makes a lot of sense because if something is good to eat, it's, it's going to be domesticated. Um, and this is a really uh, natural kind of consequence of, of a relationship with humans. So one of the first things, one of the interesting things about plant domestication is because of the genomic re revolution, we can now find out specifically what genes were involved in domestication. So it's a little challenging in animals, but we seem to have gotten a little further in plants. And so um, in plants, one of the first thing, genes that changes is a, a, a gene for seed shattering. So most native grasses, and, and a lot of our domesticates are grasses, when you pick them and the seeds are ripe, they blow off and they fall to the ground. And this is, of course, what makes a lot of sense for a wild species. If you would hold those seeds onto a stalk, well, that's kind of stupid. You'd have to wait for the 
not that the plants think, but you, you'd, you'd have the stalk fall and you'd get all the plants in one, uh, little seeds germinating in one area and that wouldn't be particularly good. So there's been selection to disperse seeds and there's many different ways of doing that. If you're an early farmer and you've just cut a whole bunch of rice stalks that you're gonna take and now you're gonna um, uh, thresh them, and on the way to where you're going to do this, they all fall off and, and go to the ground, you've just lost your harvest. And so very early, genes that affected um, seed shattering, and it's called shattering when, when the seeds blow off. Very early, uh, there was selection for seed shattering. And there's a number of different genetic loci involved. Um, and this is rice, actually, I, there is some rice here. Um, there, there's, there's primary seed, there's primary genes, and then genes that also affect it. And so you go from this wild type where there's no seeds on the stalk, they've all fallen off, um, and to one where it's, con where it's held on, and then here there, there are even bigger seeds and, and, and they're held on even more tightly. And we've, you can begin to analyze this. This is um, a wild type. This is African rice, um, Ariza glabarima. And this is what is an abscission zone. We're, you're going to see the results of, of abscission zones uh, in a couple of weeks. And that's when um, the, the petiole of a leaf or the petiole of a stem, the, the stalk, develops a series of cells like this that, allow, that, that then um, allow this to break off and, and to the leaves to fall or the, um, the seed to disperse. So this is, um, this is the wild type. This is what happens in nature in order for rice to, to drop its seeds so that you can produce the next generation in nature. The, the non-shattering kind, you can see there's a little bit of those, um, those cells. And this is a transcription uh, factor. It's a yabby factor. Um, you can see the cells here, but they don't connect all the way. And that allows the, the seeds to be retained on the stalk. And so really very careful molecular analysis allows us to understand the, the, these seeds. And when we have modifiers, the, the direction and the number of cells here in this non-shattering type is different. So you might have some that are very close to being completely breaked off and some that might just not have very many at all. <coughs> So one of the interesting things for really understanding, again, this molecular aspect of domestication is corn. Um, and the domestication of corn, of course, is an amazing, um, an amazing um, uh, aspect of plant domestication. So um, it really provides a case study. So this is um, an old, very famous photograph. This is um, a, a very early um, kind of domesticated corn. This is the wild ancestor of corn, uh, Tiocente. Um, each one, of this, the, each one of these little things here is a grain, um, or is one of these kernels of corn. Um, what you see, this dark stuff here, it's, it's a gloom. It's this like hard nut-like case. Um, and of course, we've gone from this to these more primitive types of, of ears of corn to the, the kind of corn that we see in our fields. Um, the other thing, so, so there's been lots and lots of changes. The wild ancestor, Tiocente here, it looks like a big weed. And if you were looking at rice, you would see the same sort of thing. The wild ancestors tend to be perennial. They grow year after year. They produce lots and lots and lots of different stalks. And the yield tends to be fairly low. And then the domesticated maize that we have is very, very different. Because you can see that there, this is a whole plant. It has a single stalk, um, not branched at all. Um, obviously, a very a large ear of corn. Um, so. How do you get from these multiple stems to this? Well, there's a gene for apical dominance, TB1. Um, so that's been analyzed, and we know that that's one of the genes that's involved in domestication. So in this case, when humans were, were um, selecting for enhanced um, grain production, they were selecting on specific genetic loci. And we see the, the, the footprint of that selection when we do a genomic analysis of the wild ancestor, Tiocente, and the domesticated corn. Um, another one that I just talked about is, this is Tiocente, um, and this, this is like a, a, a hard shell around the grain. Um, and this is um, a gloom architecture gene. So the gloom, we know glooms, like if you eat co um, corn, sometimes you get parts stuck between your teeth. That's the remnants of a gloom. So this is, um, this is a very hard gloom. And then, of course, in the course of selection, you get something like this, where the glooms are just those little bits and pieces that stick. Um, and the gene is involved as TGA1, so we know uh, the genetic analysis of that. 
And then finally, um, we can do ancient DNA. And so um, you, the, the amazing thing about the ancient DNA work is here, this is a, a corn uh, a cob that was dated. Um, in, the, in the DNA archaeological work, what's so remarkable is that you have radiocarb you have, have dating of a particular um, uh, piece of, of corn or a seed. So you know the, about the date of where that, that um, came from. And then you, ha you can do genomic analysis. And so you have a date, and you can do the analysis and know what the genotype was at that point. It's really, really remarkable. Um, so if you look at a modern, this is a pie diagram of, of genes that are involved in domestication. So we're looking at a specific genetic locus. Um, this is modern corn. This is um, New Mexico corn um, from about uh, 600 BP to about 1800, and then even older corn. And you can just begin to see the differences um, in, in all of these different kinds of corn. And so we're, be, we're able to really get a very, very close um, close idea of, of the actual genetic course of domestication. So what does this all mean? Why, why do we even care about studying domestication? Well, many of us care at universities because we just want to know. We want to know how did we develop this association with plants and animals? Um, how how, how have it, has that affected the course of, of, of our civilizations? But there's also a really interesting um, aspect of this, and that is the, the kind of, if you will, the, the journey, the history of, of domestication. So we started out with probably um, individuals harvesting plants that were growing out in the wild. Um, I study uh, uh, rice, and the native populations of wild rice are sometimes very scarce, and I've always wondered about how humans would pick this when, if you go now to Thailand and Cambodia and, and Myanmar, you'll find just little pockets of it. Um, and you figure out, why would people ever harvest this stuff? And then I saw my first population in an area that was a marshy area where um, it was a native population. And um, it was a huge area, water. And about the only thing you saw were these wild rice plants. And so that was, that's the kind of environment, that was the kind of thing that humans gathered when they had these huge native populations. We don't see them anymore, particularly with rice, because if it's a good area for wild rice with lots of, of water, it's a great area for a rice paddy. So you don't see that too often. But there's this, this kind of foraging. So non-intentional selection, probably initially as commensals, all the way now to the future, uh, to what we're doing now, and that is gene editing of our modern varieties, of course, of, 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 of grains and, and um, many different kinds of plants. And so this gets to a really interesting aspect, because when we start talking about genetic modification and gene editing, this is kind of selection, but it's selection in a different way. But what we're doing is we're still transforming and we're still changing. Um, and well, the last thing I want to leave you with is, is potential for future domestication. We've seen this in animals. One of the most interesting things about plants is that there are about 20,000 edible plant species. Um, that's the estimate. Uh, about 2,000 of them are economically important, and about 30 of them provide most of the world's food. And so one of the things that many people have thought about is there's a potential for additional plant domestication providing new kinds of foods from the wild species that are out there. And, and a number of plants have been more recently domesticated. The kiwi berry is a good one. It used to be called, um, was it gooseberry? Um, what was that? Gooseberry, yeah. That's um, not, not particularly exciting. Um, and once you change the name, then people began to, to really um, to, to domesticate it and, and to have a very large market. And this is just some of the abundance of fruits that you see in the tropics. We don't have quite that level here, although with modern um, transportation, we're beginning to see it. But such things as, as, uh, as uh, cassava and, and mangosteens and uh, ramdupans and, and all sorts of different things make uh, for some really interesting potential domesticated um, plant species. And so this course of domestication, it's, it's of, of intellectual his, um, interest, it's academic, but it also is really practical. Um, and it has allowed us to really expand, I think, the kind of food that we eat. And particularly given the sort of global situation where more and more populations are becoming urban, um, where we have uh, parts of the earth where 
regions of the globe where, where agriculture is really suffering because of climate change. This whole idea of expanding what we use, expanding the nutritional quality of the food that we have really does rest on some of these basic fundamental principles that first came out in domestication. So with that, we're very happy. Um, we're going to have some microphones in the, um, in the aisles, and I'm really happy to address some questions. So thank you for your attention.